Now, what I wanted to do today was to turn to certain parts of Palani's essay, Aristotle Discovers the Economy, um, just to look briefly at the way in which he goes about identifying what is specific to the economy as anything but a universal or natural condition. I want to put off looking at his discussion of Aristotle until after we have gone into Aristotle um, on our own and to bring him back in at the appropriate time. Uh, but uh, let me just say one thing about Pogliani. Um, he's a Hungarian, you know, grew up prior to the First World War, fought in it, eventually fled Austria after the Anschluss came to the United States, um, ended up having to reside in Canada because his wife was a, had, had a, an earlier history as a communist and was not allowed to remain in the United States. He wrote, a, I think, a very exciting book called The Great Transformation, of which we're going to be reading some extracts later in the term. Um, I highly recommend it. It's a discussion of the great transformation that was constituted by both the emergence of the economy and the response to the emergence of the economy on the part of civil society and the state, which in a certain respect had to engage in efforts to, one might say, protect itself from the economy. So that book is called The Great Transformation. I, mean, I, I recommend reading it in full at some point. Now, Pogliani, in this essay on Aristotle discovers the economy, you know, it's beginning by first pointing out that Aristotle uh, is regarded as someone who has very little to say about uh, the nature of the economy. And the remarks that he does make, um, fragmentary as they are, brief as they are, are certainly regarded today by most economic theorists as being completely off mark as not really telling us anything about economic reality. But in a certain sense, that's really to miss <coughs> what Aristotle is, is doing. Because Aristotle is by no means concerned with describing a particular convention. He's rather concerned with how human affairs ought to be. And for that reason, when he touches upon the kind of activities that may be independently realized in the economy. He's not really concerned with giving an accurate description of how they function in the economy as we know it. He's rather concerned with evaluating what role, if any, these activities and functions can have with regard to the life that is worth living. Now, we're going to see in due time what that amounts to and what kind of opposition and intentions that involves. And you know, Polani, Polani points out that uh, you know, Aristotle himself is writing at a time when uh, the Athenian world was undergoing certain social transformations or certain types of activities that would become the fulcrum of the full-blown economy are beginning to gain uh, in a <coughs> degree of prevalence, even if they remain very much at the margins. And you know, Aristotle is concerned with thinking about them, even though in many respects what he's thinking about is by no means the predominant form of, uh, of uh, association that is to be found. Now, if you, if you look at the kind of um, the kind of uh, conceptual terms that Pogliani refers to in trying to point to uh, the economy. Um, and in many respects, what he's doing is, is similar to what you encountered in Heilbrunner. Um, he points out that uh, the economy is something in a sense that is in a way nameless and both nameless and not really conceived as such prior to modern times. And this is 
in a sense, because we're dealing with something that is what it is by being a sphere that is, as he puts it, disembedded from other spheres of life. You know, the same activities that get independently realized in a disembedded sphere in the economy are found in various entanglements in other kinds of historical periods, social formations. In fact, in all that uh, could be said to predate uh, the rise of modern times. Where there are the kind of activities that become separated out and engaged in on the terms that that separation allows. In pre-modern times, we find these various activities that might pertain to uh, the provisioning of goods, consumption, the use of land, the uh, offering of services, and so forth. These are always entangled with other kinds of relationships beside the strictly economic. These could involve religious observance and religious motivations. It could involve kingship relations of all sorts, be they the kingship of a family or the extended kingship of a fratry or a tribe. Um, it can involve all sorts of uh, social organizations based on birth, such as caste systems and the like. Uh, but in all these cases, you know, we do find things such as transfers of goods, transfers of services, but they are not being done in the same way in which they're done when we have a separate sphere that could be called an economy that is shielded from both religious observance, from the exercise of political power, from the exercise of kinship relations, uh, and the exercise of any other kind of organizations that might intrude upon the, the organization of life. Now, under the market system, which realizes this disembedded economy, we have a sphere in which individuals are going to be interacting in terms of motives that, in a certain sense, do not operate independently, apart from this system. We're not dealing with things that really could be defined simply in terms of the nature of the self, as the self operates on psychological terms with things. We're not dealing with matters that are just defined by purely natural relationships. We're dealing with a certain mode of activity with its own particular kinds of ends that are specific to this special kind of dis disembedded sphere. Only within its confines do we have a situation where individuals are going to be interacting in a way that we can really speak of their behavior governed strictly by economic <coughs> motives. Motives that can be thought of as dealing with uh, an interest in gain, an interest in avoiding destitution. Now, I just want to point to two types of distinctions that, uh, that um, Pollyanna invokes um, as possible ways uh, of thinking about the disembedded economy. And first he invokes Sir Henry Sumner Maine, who proposed that one way of, of understanding what distinguishes modern society and the modern economy is that here we're dealing with a society that is based on contract. In contrast to pre-modern societies, in particular ancient societies, which are based not on contract, but on status. Contract versus status. Now status here is identified as a distinct position that an individual occupies. Not by choice, but by factors given independently of the individual's choice. And in particular, you know, a prime factor of that sort, which, has to do, which could be spoken of as status, would be status set by birth. 
Now, obviously, one's birth could be said to be something that involves a relationship to kin in an immediate fashion. So one's status, in a sense, can be identified in terms of kinship relations, which are in societies governed by status, allowed to determine the way an individual interacts in all spheres of life. In such a situation, nepotism is not bad. Nepotism is the way in which things operate. Nepotism obviously only becomes a problem if one regards kinship relations as not being ties that should prevail in certain spheres, such as politics, such as perhaps society. I mean, nepotism only becomes a problem if one begins to consider kinship relations, for better or worse, to not be appropriate beyond the confines of the household. <coughs> which, of course, presupposes that the household is an entity that has let go of society, that has let go of politics, that has let go of wealth on the one hand and power on the other. But we have status defined as a governing principle of community, where individuals' relations to others, their activities, what they do, how they relate to other in the various spheres which we might think of as separated, that is, how they are related to power, how they are related to the use of things, how they exercise a particular role. All of these things are defined by status, by something given independently of their will. Now, contract, on the other hand, obviously is a relationship that is specific to a particular kind of interaction where individuals recognize each other in a certain capacity. To engage in contract, you have to engage in a relationship to someone else. And in both cases, the parties to contract recognize each other as what? As what kind of individuals? To enter into contract, what, what must you be recognized to be? Free agent? Well, a free agent, but in what specific sense? You have to have something to contract about, right? Now, of course, you're contracting about something that, in a way, you <coughs> dispose of, that you can choose to, one could say, contract over. But, you know, contract pertains to, in a sense, Entering into an agreement with other, with someone else, regarding something of yours that you can alienate in various ways. It could be something you own that you're going to alienate completely in the sense of uh, trading pop property, selling property. It could be a matter of lending something, agreeing to engage in a certain kind of service, etc. But the point is that the individuals in question face each other as autonomous owners of something that as owners they have the prerogative to alienate as they see fit. On the other hand, they can't transfer unilaterally to anyone else because contract is a relationship where the parties involved are both recognized as owners. And what you own is what you lay your will into. You, know, you don't own something that I happen to stick on your desk such as all my garbage, right? You have to agree to take ownership of it and to lay claim to it as your own. So on the one hand, if we want to think about a society as being based on contract, we're in a sense thinking about a society based preeminently on interactions with, among individuals where they operate as owners. And we might use the term persons to signify owners. Um, Hegel uses that term in that respect, um, as we'll see, in distinction from other kinds of, of, of modalities. One thing to note about being an owner, you're not an owner by birth. You determine yourself to be an owner by laying your will in what is yours. Or, alternately, by being recognized by others 
as having ownership of something that might be regarded as inalienable. Because in a certain respect, there's one kind of property that can't help but be inalienable. What is it? If you're going to be an owner. And if you're going to function as an owner, what can you not give up? What? Your body? Yeah, your body. Why can't you give up your body? Why can you not alienate your body in its entirety and retain your character as an owner, remain recognized as an owner? Because it's a vehicle, is what houses yourself. Yeah, I mean, you can't distinguish between your body and the exercise of your will. So that, you know, if you are not recognized to have exclusive ownership of your body, you're tantamount to a slave, you're tantamount to a thing that others can take possession of. So indeed, it's a mistake to think that property is, is in principle, alienable. Your ownership of your body is inalienable. But what you can alienate regarding your body are either parts of your body that don't undermine your agency. Right? You could give, up, give, up, give away your kidney. Um, there's a little museum go to Elvis Presley up the road in Clarksville, I think. Where you can find in a vial um, a fingernail that someone found in Graceland and other things. Right? There are various parts of your body that can be alienated conceivably. Uh, but you can also alienate the use of your body <coughs> on what terms? What would have to be true? What? Well, what has to be true about the alienation? For it to be something you can do as an owner. Can you alienate all the use of your body? Why not? Because then you can't do anything in your own right. No, you can't retain any will, if that's the case. If someone has exclusive use of your body, you've lost your agency, you've forfeited it. And you can't transfer something that involves all of your agency. Because there's no you that stands out of the relation presiding over what is being transferred. Right? So what you can alienate is the use of your body for a limited time. Such as when you sign a contract to be an employee, for example. Well, I just bring up these, these terms. You know, obviously, they seem to have a kind of economic dimension to them, or one might say that uh, certainly the economy of a market system revolves very much about relationships where individuals could be said to engage in contractual relations, where they are, in some respect, exchanging property or the use of property of different sorts. And another thing about contract, um, if one makes it the fundamental principle of all norms, which is something that we will find being done by liberal theory or social contract theory, one presumes that, in a sense, the principle that lies at the root of all obligation is the owner. And the owner understood as, in a sense, the, f the determiner of all norms, of all obligations, is someone who will <coughs> be only obliged by what that individual imposes upon himself in connection to others. In other words, one can look at uh, the primacy of contract as being at the root of the operation of a community. If one were to say that what is being privileged is the liberty of the individual owner, such that that individual is not obliged to pursue any ends that they have not imposed upon themselves. Because what happens when you enter into a contract? You are imposing upon yourself and the other party to the contract obligations that did not exist prior to your entry into that agreement. Now note, contract has been invoked by social contract theory as if it could be the basis of political legitimacy as well as civil legality, which as we're going to see are not the same. Here, it's also being invoked as if contract could be thought of as being the underlying principle 
of the market system. As if, in other words, one can think of economic relations of the disengaged economy as being, in effect, nothing more than property relations. And we're, we're going, we want to see whether that is really a viable move, whether in a certain respect one can think of economic relations as just a matter of property relations. If, by the way, you think in those terms, then economic rights take on a certain limitation. Because if you think about the economy as being based upon nothing other than the operation of contracts, then, in a sense, you can't <coughs> speak of there being any economic rights beyond those of what's involved in respecting the property of one another. <coughs> Which means what kind of considerations fall out of play as matters of economic right? Well, any kind of specifically economic opportunity uh, is not going to have any, any space as an independent normative principle. That is, as long as one respects the property rights of individuals and respects what people happen to own, no one is entitled to anything more than what property owners choose to do in their, contra in their contracts with one another. We'll have to see whether there are economic entitlements or matters of economic justice that go beyond simply the observance of respect for ownership. Well, anyway, here we have one way of thinking about the divide between the disengaged economy and the organizations that happened historically to have antedated it in, let's say, pre-modern times. Um, here we have an attempt to try to think about the divide in terms of, on the one hand, the rule of relations of status, where individuals interact on the basis of, in a sense, a determination of what they are that is given independently of their will, given by other kinds of relations, such as kinship relations, or alternately, <coughs> one thinks or attempts to think of the disengaged economy as if one could identify its essence by thinking of the economy as being a sphere in which individuals interact as property owners. And that's how we get to the essence of it. Now, again, as, as Polanyi points out, indeed, in the market, in the market system, in the disengaged economy, Individuals who are economic agents and acting in specifically economic motivations are owners and can't engage in economic relations if they are not owners. This indeed is a necessary condition. And another way of putting it, if you want to think about the economy as something that has become a universal sphere to which all members of society belong, that could be said if we take some recognizance of this contrast between status and contract, that the existence of the economy as something in which all members of society participate and interact in an economic way, as being something that involves <coughs> the universal recognition of individuals as owners, or one might say the universal realization of, of property relations and the, you could say, the enforcement of property rights. Um, which, as I mentioned, requires the overcoming of what in particular? That might be regarded as, as complete obliteration of property rights. And this regard could be looked upon as being, in some respect, antithetical to the principle of an economy, if one thinks of it as being based on contract. What relationship? Slavery, right? Slavery. Because what is it to be a slave? To be a slave is to be a, a human, or more, more generally speaking, a rational agent. Because there are, I'm sure there are slaves on other planets where there is intelligent life. Some, at some point in the history, probably. 
they don't have to be homo sapiens, but they have to be rational agents, not just irrational animals. But they're, they're rational agents who nevertheless are not recognized to own their own body, but instead are subject to the will of another. As such, they cannot interact in the market as a member of the market. The same thing, of course, applies to a situation which, right, has existed until very recent times, where women were excluded from independent property rights, where instead it was the head of the household, the male head of the household, who was the owner. And the woman did not have full-fledged property rights at all. The woman was not a slave, but nevertheless, the woman was not really recognized as an owner. <coughs> you can see that also would be antithetical to at least the principle of the economy as a disengaged sphere, if we think of it as at least involving <coughs> as a necessary condition the universalization of ownership, of being recognized as an owner, or a person, if I can associate that with being an owner. Now, status, by the way, um, I, I, I've spoken of here in connection with a position or a role one occupies because of something one has not chosen. Um, and this, of course, will be true of all of those social formations where individuals, in a sense, do what they do because of how they have been born, for example. But one can also think about status in a different way that is separate from contract. And this is something that I think will have more um, applicability when we look at Aristotle in certain respects. And that is to say, to look at individuals having a different role to play in virtue of differences in merit. Differences in merit. Because when we think about contractual relations, and we'll get into this more today, when we think about contractual relations, when you enter into a contract, your status as an owner is simply that you have embodied your will in some factor, which you can thereby contract <coughs> over with some other individual who you recognize on the same terms, and they recognize you. All other considerations regarding who you are so are a matter of indifference. They don't play a role for dealing with this being a contractual relation. Because all that counts is that individuals will to dispose over what is theirs and agree over some kind of mutual um, transaction. And what determines it is their agreement. Well, th there are other ways in which what an individual is or who the individual is could bear upon what kind of activities they can engage in. And who they are might be something that is not independent of their will. It might be determined by how they will. Their merit might be something that derives from how they will. And if one were to recognize merit as a playing role, a constitutive role, and how individuals are to interact with one another, how they are to dispose over property, how they are to have access to power and so forth. We're also speaking about a situation where you could say there's a kind of status that plays a role. It's very distinct from a situation where one allows contractual relations to play a determinative role. Now there's another contrast that Pogliani uh, refers to, and then we're going to be dealing with all of the issues. because so we want to try to grope towards what are the proper concepts, categories, in order to, to lay hold of the specific nature of economic relations. And as I've mentioned, this is ultimately a normative, a normative matter. Um, the only way to really conceptualize what the economy is is to think what it ought to be. Just as the only way to think what the state is, it's a matter of conceiving what it ought to be. And indeed, to think of whether there <coughs> ought to be a state or ought to be an economy. Um, which is why, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more, why taking up a normative investigation of the economy, or of the state, or of the family, or of law, cannot be done independently 
of a general exploration of what ought to be. Because one can't take for granted that there ought to be an economy, that there ought to be a state, that there ought to be civil law, that there ought to be the family. One has to think about what ought to be in general and then see where things fit. And that, by the way, is why those thinkers who have thought most deeply about these matters are not specialists in prescriptive economics or in prescriptive politics. They have to think about what is normative as a whole. They have to think about conduct in its totality. And we are going to be compelled to do that. And in a moment, we're going to begin doing that. Now, Polanyi also refers to another uh, sort of turn of the century figure who attempted to, to try to think about how one can lay hold of what is specific to modern society <coughs> and the emergence of the economy. This is Ferdinand Tunis, who distinguished a good distinction between what he called community and what he called society, and spoke of society as being what you find exemplified in the modern society where you have the disengaged economy, in contrast to the kind of historical formations where you have what he wants to speak of <coughs> as community. And to some degree, the distinction between community and contract um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The distinction between community and society parallels that between uh, status and contract. Um, but there are some differences. And of course, one of the differences has to do with how these matters are being evaluated. Because in the case of Maine, Maine regarded the emergence of society based on contract as equivalent to an emancipation from, in a sense, the barbarity or the oppression of societies that were governed by status, where status could be thought of as being an imposition upon the will of individuals, upon the freedom of individuals. By contrast, Tunis is regarding community as something affirmative, and regarding a society which, to some degree, um, is to be looked at as involving spheres of, uh, well, um, economic activity that does involve contractual relations as lacking something the community provides. Community provides, in some respect, an affirmative sense of membership, a sense of intimacy in some sense. It gives some kind of substantial identity that is lacking in the autonomous, in the anonymous, impersonal, completely external relations that individuals find themselves as members of a disengaged economy and a society defined in terms of uh, those kind of operations, where individuals, in a sense, are interacting on the basis of the pursuit of their own, their own economic interests, their own economic gain instead of associating in terms of some kind of common good that binds them together, <coughs> some kind of affirmative uh, community sense of some sort. Now, I think this raises um, an important question concerning how we ought to think about the economy. Because again, it is, it is fairly uh, commonplace <coughs> to think about the distinction between the economy and one might say the modern society, which has an economy, and a family distinguished from the economic domain, and a state distinguished from both the family and the economic domain, as being one lacking the kind of embedded community to be found in pre-modern uh, historical formations. That the modern condition is one of separation, alienation, a uh, situation where allegedly individuals, in a sense, basically use one another as means, where to some degree a kind of instrumentality reigns supreme. I think we, w we want to really consider seriously whether the economy, in its distinction from 
the other separated spheres, lacks community, is to be thought of as a situation where individuals are acting in a way that could be regarded as purely individualist or not. <coughs> are they acting in a way in which we are all merely instruments of one another? And where any kind of common bonds are being undermined or not? And if so, is that bad? Or is it good? Should it be overcome? Should it not be overcome? You know, these are issues that we want to think. And obviously it depends upon really what is the character of the economic order. Now, think of these just as guideposts. Uh, what we ultimately have to do is to try to think about what <coughs> it ought to be. And I, and I say that in general. Because if we really want to take up questions regarding what the economy ought to be, or should there even be an economy, we really first have to ask about what ought to be. How should we act? How should our relations to others be organized? Because, in a sense, we can't take for granted that there should be an economic order disengaged from a state and a family or a state disengaged from kinship relations and so forth and so on. But all of these are, are normative questions. And we can't just start you know, dogmatically presuming that the kind of boundaries that are commonplace today are, are the boundaries that should prevail. Now, to deal with this issue, we obviously have to overcome the specter of nihilism, which to some degree has become, in certain respects, a kind of a common uh, prejudice. Namely, it's futile to attempt to use reason to think what ought to be, just as it's futile to presume that there can be any kind of objective determination of what ought to be. Instead, what ought to be is a matter of, well, value that is ultimately subjective or conventional. Well, you know, the problem we face in dealing with what ought to be or what is normative is that it cannot be, you know, we cannot determine what ought to be by beginning with any norms, by beginning with any conceptions of what is right as opposed to what is wrong. Right? We'd be begging the question, obviously. We'd be taking for granted what has to be established. Which means somehow or other, we have to go about determining what is ethical, that is, what is normative, how to divide what is right or wrong, without beginning with any normative specifications whatsoever. But on the other hand, we cannot simply determine what is normative by appealing to what is. Because what is, in virtue of being, doesn't uh, have the character of being what's normative. It might just as well be what is wrong, as well as what is right. So observation is not going to tell us what is right. We have to somehow rise above the given. Now the question is, how can we go about doing that? If on the one hand, we can't begin by drawing upon any, anything normative. On the other hand, we can't derive the normative from what is just given. How are we to operate? It might appear that we can't get anywhere. It might appear that, in effect, really all attempts to establish normativity are just exercises of what Nietzsche characterized as a will to power, where what are we doing? We're coming up with a norm that is something that is supposed to hold universally and be valid for all. But because there's no way of coming up with what is genuinely universally valid in a normative sense. What we're really doing is putting forward something that's arbitrary, something that I have chosen to put forward, something that I'm therefore shoving down everyone's throat in a kind of power play. And that's what all engagements in the stipulation of norms or engagement in the activities that used to be called the exercise of rationality are really amount to. Power plays, wills to power. Engagement and willing to power, where I'm putting forward something that really is something I have just chosen arbitrarily, something that is particular to me, and put it out as if it were universally binding. In effect, imposing my will upon everyone else. 
Now, of course, those who lay claim to build the power and think about rationality and the, the attempts to determine normativity that are, that are endemic to rationality as being just an exercise of will to power are presuming that rationality always in, is doing just that. It's always operating arbitrarily. What's the problem with affirming will to power in the universal manner? Well, it, you know, it, it's, it's making a universal claim of its own. It's, it's giving a universal characterization of what rationality really is. Right? It's deconstructing rationality, <coughs> and its deconstruction is being offered as, in a sense, being unqualified, not just an arbitrary stipulation. No better or worse than any other characterization. Now, unfortunately, the challenge of nihilism is not so easily removed, because nihilism need not be equivalent to an affirmation of skepticism. Where skepticism denies it, you know, we can know. But in doing so, it cuts the ground out from under its, itself right? by making, in a sense, a claim of its own that one cannot know. But nihilism need not do that. Nihilism need not be something connected to skepticism. The nihilist can be someone who does not deny that we can know. But one thing we can know is that when we're dealing with conduct, Precisely because we're dealing with what can be other than it is, we're dealing with what's arbitrary. We're dealing with what's conventional. And for that very reason, it's impossible to determine in any objective way what ought to be. Now, in a certain respect, if we're going to attempt to surmount the challenge of nihilism, it might seem that we can begin with what it is that conduct minimally deals with. And conduct is minimally dealing with acting on purpose. We're not dealing with behavior that is necessitated. This behavior that is necessitated is blameless and not to be praised. And if we're dealing with conduct and questions of right or wrong, we're dealing with what we're responsible for, what can or cannot be, what might or might not be undertaken. And in that respect, we're dealing with, in a way, what could be considered conduct, namely behaving on purpose. And if you think about it, acting on purpose or conduct has two, two possible dimensions that one could point to and try to think of, well, whether these are going to give us a basis for determining how we can distinguish between right and wrong conduct. On the one hand, we have what one does on purpose, what end one pursues. On the other hand, one has the form of willing, how one goes about uh, pursuing what one wills. One has what one wills and how one wills. One has the content of willing and the form of willing. And it might be that if we want to see where we can establish what conduct ought to be undertaken, perhaps we can look at either the ends of conduct and see if there's a way of discriminating among them, if there's a way of ranking them rationally, or ultimately seeing if there's some privileged form of willing, some way of willing, some how that is proper as opposed to what is improper. Now, it turns out that Aristotle pioneers an attempt to begin ethics by starting with the normatively neutral structure of conduct, namely of acting on purpose. And he attempts to see whether if we focus on what one wills, on the content of the end, if that will provide the resources for being able to discriminate between what is good and what is not good in conduct. Now I pointed out that these two sides to willing, if one thinks of conduct as being a matter of acting on purpose. There's what one wills and how one wills. Aristotle focuses his attention on what one wills, on the end of conduct, as a locus for where normativity is to be determined. Now, in a certain respect, you can look upon that way of beginning as being not accidentally <coughs> where ethics, in a certain <coughs> respect, would be expected to begin. 
And that's partly because the end of conduct could just as well be how one wills as what one wills. That is, one could make it one's purpose to act in a certain way, a way that could be accompanied by willing all sorts of different purposes. <coughs> or, you know, as, as Aristotle puts it, you know, one, can, one can think of the end of conduct as being both a product of activity as well as an activity itself. Right? One can will to act, and the action is the end. And thereby, what does one will? One wills to act in a certain way. Ultimately, one can will to achieve an end as a product of activity. Now, given all of that, which, which in a sense is a, are distinctions that can be drawn without knowing anything about the difference between right and wrong, or good and bad, uh, Aristotle points out that if you think about conduct that has as its purpose a product of activity, then automatically, if you engage in that kind of activity, the, act, the product is of greater value than the activity that is undertaken to produce a product. Why is that? Why can we say that without, having, without taking for granted anything regarding right or wrong? Why, if one engages in activity for the sake of producing something as the outcome of one's activity, the product has greater value than the activity? Why? Well, one, one's purpose is to produce something. One only undertakes the activity if one is doing it for this reason, to achieve the product. The action is itself of no value if it does not result in the product for which it is undertaken. The activity is instrumental to the product. Right? And this is just built into the activity, irrespective of what value the product itself might have. From the point of view of the agent, of anyone who's acting in these terms, the activity has the less value than the product. But the question is, what about the value of the product or an end? Aristotle points out that if <coughs> an end is itself of value only as a means to something else, and if that is true of all ends, then all action is vain, all conduct is pointless, all conduct is ultimately devoid of any value. That is, if all ends are instrumental in character, if they are only for the sake of something else, there's no point in doing anything at all. Why? Why is that the case? Yes. You fall back into arbitration. I mean, there's just there's no master in you have nothing you're aiming at. It would just be arbitrary. Be well, look, I'd be doing something because it leads to something else. Then you ask, why would I want to do that? And if every end is only a value because it serves as a means to something else, it would be undertaken because it leads to something else, but that would only be a value if we can find it leading to something else. And this goes on infinitely. We never can finish our search for why we're doing what we're doing. We can never really find a basis for undertaking anything if all ends are instrumental. So that tells us in a certain respect, if there is going to be any possibility whatsoever of discriminating between what we should do and what we should not do, by focusing on the content of what we will, we have to find an end that is not <coughs> merely instrumental, but an end that is undertaken for its own sake, an end that is good in itself. Now the problem is, what if there are a plurality or an indefinite plurality of things that can be done for their own sake? I mean, it's easiest to think about this looming pluralization of ends in themselves if you think of act activity. I mean, it, you could do anything just to do it. Right? There seems to be no limit. You could kill someone just to do it. You could study philosophy just to do it. You could write a paper just to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So in a certain sense, even if You're not going to escape pointlessness 
you're not going to be able to obtain anything of value unless you can somehow come up with an end that is, for its own sake, and not instrumental to something else, does not have its value lying elsewhere. It's not sufficient to just locate something that is an end in itself. You have to have some way of getting rid of this indefinite plurality, which leaves you not knowing where to, what to do or where to go. And Aristotle proposes what would appear to be the only solution to the problem. You can only solve the problem. There can only be any possibility of discriminating between action that is, has value and action that does not if we can find an end that is not just for its own sake, but in effect uniquely occupies the position of being an end for its own sake. And what allows this end to uniquely occupy the position of being undertaken for its own sake is that it somehow is that for which all other ends are undertaken. Now I say are undertaken, not should be undertaken. Because if I said should be undertaken, what am I making appeal to? In a sense, we have no right to make appeal to. Yeah, that we have some separate standard by which to judge what should or should not be undertaken. But we don't. We're trying to figure out what is normativity, what can be normative. So the only solution is to find an end that is not only undertaken for its own sake, but is the only thing that is undertaken for its own sake. Why? Because it is such that it subordinates all other activities to its own realization. Now, if you go back a moment, you might ask, well, what could possibly fit the bill of being an end that is not only for its own sake, but a master end? And we saw that ends, in a way, could be both products of activity and activities. Now, can you think of a product of activity that might be regarded as being for its own sake, not instrumental? <coughs> what would be the example of, of, of a product of activity that should have that stature? Art. So that we don't put it to use. Yeah. Art. What kind of art? Because uh, we use the term differently than less than just painting. Yeah, fine art. Because in a sense, what is, it, what is manifest in the way in which, for example, you find paintings presented? Beauty. What? Beauty. Well, but if you think about how they're presented, what might, in a sense, be um, tied to their having beauty, beauty, as opposed to being objects which provide gratification or serve some other instrumental means? Uniqueness. Well, not just uniqueness, but you know, which has something to do with you know why, in a sense, they they could be said to have a kind of value that can't be. Um, substituted for it for some reason. Uh, you know, they're presented preeminently, maybe deservedly, in a public space open to all, and you're not supposed to do anything with them except take them in. You're not supposed to put them to use. Keep your hands off them. The guard will tell you. You know, fine art could be regarded as having a certain value. Even if it could be bought and sold as a commodity, nevertheless, it still can be regarded as being an object of beauty, and beauty might be regarded as being something of a, having a kind of intrinsic worth, not being something for the sake of edification or titillation, but something distinct in character. But why can the work of art not qualify as, in a sense, a master end? Or another way of putting it, which I haven't used, but I should, the highest good. The one and only highest good, right? It can only be one highest good, and it's highest because nothing else can occupy its position. Why can't a work of fine art not occupy that position? Because in a sense, what art really instills in us is that kind of happiness or the highest good. So it kind of, I don't know, it's, I feel like it still is kind of a means to an end in a way. But what does, but, but what does the work of art <coughs> not do or have about it that is required for something to be a highest good? For my own matter. Yeah, it leaves us alone. It doesn't lay claim to other activities and in any way determine how other activities are, are pursued. Moreover, there are a plurality of work of art. And there's no limit to how many there can be, in effect. Right. So in a sense, if we really want to find something that can qualify as the highest good, it's not going to be a product of activity. It's going to be an activity. An activity that's going to have this unique character of not being subordinate to any other activity. It's not instrumental to anything else. It's not pursued for the sake of anything else. 
is pursued just for its own sake. And in being pursued for its own sake, it is a master activity that, in a sense, subordinates all other activities under it so that they are performed for its own sake, so as to enable it to be performed. The highest good can only be a ruling activity. Ethics, which can only be a science of the highest good, because otherwise it would appear. There's no way that we can impute value to any activity. The science of the highest good is going to be about an activity that must be a ruling activity that must therefore be political. <coughs> ethics is ultimately a science of politics. And Aristotle's so-called Nicomachean ethics and politics are not separate works. Now, these works of Aristotle, by the way, they're all just lecture notes. Um, I think the Constitution of Athens might be his only real work that he could be said to have published, so to speak. All the rest are just lecture notes sort of haphazardly strewn about, maybe not that haphazardly, but you know, you've already seen, I think, the kind of repetitions there are, and you know, things are not completely fully developed as in a finished work. But ethics is not separate from politics. Ethics must be concerned, ultimately, with the life of the citizen. Because only as a citizen can one engage in an activity that is ultimately of value. And this tells us that, in a sense, what we're going to be dealing with in, being, in studying ethics and being ethical is engaging in activity politics. And the engaging, engagement in politics is such that it is going to have to ensure that what it needs is provided for. It has to be self-sufficient. Why? Why? What? Well, it goes back to what you were saying. If it's not, then you're not valuing the activity you're valuing the end. Yeah, I mean, after all, if it is really what is for its own sake, it is what alone has ultimate value, then it's imperative that it provide for itself, that all resources be put in play to ensure that the life of the citizen can be engaged in. Now, this sort of sets the framework for, in a sense, this really first fundamental attempt to determine what ought to be. Politics has primacy. But there's a problem that one immediately confronts, namely the specification of the highest good as a ruling activity, as indeed an activity that, in a sense, is not something, by the way, that one can engage in individually. I cannot individually, as an isolated individual, <coughs> engage in an activity that is going to subordinate all other affairs to my activity. I can only do it as part of an association, which has as its end its own perpetuation and subordination of everything to it. Only by being, in a sense, a member of a body politic or political association <coughs> can I possibly engage in this kind of activity, activity that has a stature. That is, have a life that's worth leading. But the problem is that <coughs> on these terms, it seems that we are left with an equation between might and right. Why? <coughs> well, it would seem that any ruling activity that manages to rule, that manages to subordinate all other affairs to itself, is going to be the highest good. There's something formal about it. In fact, it would appear that there's no way we can distinguish between good and bad regimes, for example. And it seems that, in a sense, we, we, we've lost the capacity to uh, give a proper filling. In other words, we have something that might be necessary in order for there to be normativity in conduct. But it, it appears that it's not going to be sufficient. We have to add more. And Aristotle engages in various attempts to do this. And I just want to bring up a few of them. And I, alas, I want to push through the basic arguments, which I'll have to continue into next time, uh, before we actually enter what he has to say about 
with distinct spheres that the body politic resides over, in which we might be on the lookout for anything resembling an economy or the absence of an economy. But Aristotle, for example, in a sense, he's aware of the fact that although we can say that ethics must be a science of the highest good, the highest good has to be political in character, um, it seems we need more to fill it out. And Aristotle appeals to certain things. One is the idea of happiness. Right? He points out happiness is something that, in a sense, seems to sort of fit the bill of the highest good because we don't aim to be ha happy for the sake of other things. We just want to be happy. And we do everything for the sake of being happy. Now, that does not mean that Aristotle thinks everyone is a hedonist because he points out there are different interpretations of happiness. Right? There are those who think that happiness consists in just gratification of desire. But that's equivalent to the life of an animal, an animal house. He points to wealth. You know, there's some who regard happiness as wealth and aim for wealth as if it could be that which would <coughs> be the highest good. But he points out that wealth cannot be the highest good. Why? What is it about wealth that prevents it from being the highest good? <coughs> yes? It's always used to acquire something else. Yeah, it seems that wealth is always instrumental in character. I mean, it's, it's kind of pointless if you're just acquiring it for its own sake. It's of use precisely because you can use it in various ways. So keep that in mind. Um, Aristotle, however, points out that genuine happiness will have to be an activity. Ultimately, it would have to be a form of activity, which is that of the political life. Now, again, Aristotle uses another maneuver to attempt to give filling. And I want to bring this up because it, it brings up important features that we're going to be dealing with both in Aristotle and with regard to other thinkers who attempt to deal with what ought to be and also with the nature of the economy. Aristotle engages, as you probably know if you've read book one of the ethics, in another attempt to try to fill out the content of the highest good in recognition of the fact that it's not enough to simply identify it as politics as rule. We have to go beyond that if we're going to escape simply identifying right with might. So he says, look, let's see if we can identify a distinctly human function. Um, why do we want to find out if there's a distinctly human function? <coughs> what use will that be? What will that allow us? To exactly. You know, in a sense, we can rank our life as a human if there is a function, by how well we fulfill that function. Like you can, you can rank a tool by how well it suits its purpose. Is this a good screwdriver or not? Well, is there a distinctly human purpose? And as you know, our fellow points out, look, it's not going to reside in anything that we share with plants, like nutrition and growth. It's not going to reside in what we share simply with animals, namely perception and desire and so forth. It's going to be something distinctly human, and it points to what as what is distinctly human. Reason. And reason can be employed in two respects. It can be employed theoretically. We can use reason itself as a distinctly human function. We can also act in accord with reason. And if these are the human functions, then we can rank humans and the way they lead their lives according to, to what degree they show excellence in fulfilling their function as a theorizer and as someone acting in accord with reason. And this you know, we can thereby speak of two kinds of excellences or virtues. It's the word for virtue in Greek, arete, is the same thing as excellence. Well, you can have theoretical virtue, intellectual virtue, excellence in reasoning. You can have practical virtue or excellence in what he speaks of his character in acting according to reason. And it seems, therefore, we should live a life that is virtuous. Now, has this added anything to concretizing what is the good life what it is to realize the highest good by saying we should act in accord with reason? Or have we just come back to the very beginning once again? Because after all, we're trying to determine what is it that reason prescribes we should do? Fine, we should act according to reason. That's what it is to be ethical, in effect. But simply saying that hasn't added anything to the content of what the good life comprises. Now, Aristotle nonetheless does 
speak about a variety of virtues in the ethics, as, we, as you well know. I want to speak a little bit about how he characterizes justice um, before we actually turn to the politics. And you'll be reading a little bit from the section on justice. Um, but Aristotle, in, in the discussion of justice, is speaking about uh, law and fairness, because justice can be understood in both ways. Um, justice, in a certain respect, involves equal treatment and fair treatment. Law always involves equal treatment, because law involves governing individuals by a rule that applies to all legal subjects. Right? But Aristotle here is primarily concerned with uh, fairness. And he speaks about uh, two kinds of fairness, distributional fairness or justice and rectificatory justice. And I want to discuss these, sort of setting up some of their implications for how economic relations might fit in. And then we want to finally turn to how Aristotle attempts to fill out what is the good life, what is <coughs> proper political life, what other, so, what other spheres of life does it involve as subordinate spheres to itself? And where does it put the economy? And that's what we'll turn to on Thursday. Continue reading. Uh, the selections from book two of the problems I think you'll find quite interesting. There Aristotle is concerned with how complete the unity of the state should be. Does it require communism? Does it require the abolition of private property, the abolition of family? He has quite interesting things to say that will bear upon what we are concerned with.